Welcome back, listeners, to the best-kept secret of the deep state. Like we said in our previous episode, the deep state has always sought to control information, money and government. The control of the creation of money has for a long time been under the control of the deep state. Controlling information was, of course, a vital part of obtaining monetary control. Whoever has control of information will always have a massive strategic advantage against any and all opposition. Episode 2. There is a company called Ericsson. In 1930, the very top of the banking system moved to Basel, Switzerland, with the founding of the Bank for International Settlements, the BIS. The BIS plays a key role, behind the scenes, in the global financial system as the central bank of central banks. After Thomas Harrington McKittrick, former president of the Bank for International Settlements, died in a New Jersey nursing home in 1970 at the age of 81, the New York Times hailed him as a world financier. His brief obituary described him as a man who dared to attend a certain bank meeting in Switzerland in 1940 within earshot of a French-German artillery duel, while his peers voted by proxy instead. But like many obituaries, McKittrick's death notice was more remarkable for what had been left out. As head of the BIS from 1940 to 1946, McKittrick played a crucial role in abetting Hitler's war, and at the same time revealing details about his Nazi colleagues to his friends in Washington, D.C. On McKittrick's watch, the BIS willingly accepted looted Nazi gold, conducted currency transactions for the Reichsbank, and recognized the Nazi invasion and annexation of conquered countries. In doing so, it also legitimized the role of national banks in the occupied countries in appropriating Jewish-owned assets. Indeed, the BIS was so indispensable to the overall Nazi project that Reichsbank Vice President Emil Pohl, who was later put on trial for war crimes, once referred to the BIS as the Reichsbank's only foreign branch in the final months of the war, as American GIs fought their way through Europe. But McKittrick was also a key contact between the Allies and the Nazis, passing information back and forth from Washington to Berlin. His relationship with the Third Reich was encouraged both by factions within the State Department and by the leadership of the Office for Strategic Services, the predecessor of the Central Intelligence Agency. He also acted as a back channel between anti-Nazi German business interests and the United States, and ultimately helped preserve the power of German industry after the war. Even against the opposition of Treasury Secretary Henry Morgenthau himself, McKittrick's involvement in the Bank for International Settlements began in 1931 when he joined the German Credits Arbitration Committee, which ruled in disputes between German commercial banks. One of the other two members was Marcus Laurentius Wallenberg from Stockholm's Enskilde Bank. Marcus Wallenberg was more like a mentor to McKittrick and taught him about the complicated international finances which McKittrick himself has confirmed. Just to make this even more confusing, many of the Wallenberg men share the same first name. Marcus Laurentius Wallenberg had two sons, called Marcus and Jacob Wallenberg, and they were also two of the most powerful bankers in the world at the time. During the Second World War, the Wallenberg brothers used their Enskilda bank, to play both sides to reap huge profits and further expand their sphere of influence. In May 1939, McKittrick was offered the post of president of the BIS, which he quickly accepted. Once in office, Marcus Wallenberg remained his most important mentor, teaching the American banker how to negotiate between opposing European powers, just as Wallenberg himself had done so skillfully. 
McKittrick was also a close family friend of Alan Dulles, the head of the intelligence service, which was the CIA's predecessor, the OSS, and was also based in Switzerland during World War II. The same Alan Dulles who would later defend the Wallenberg brothers in the subsequent Bosch affair, where they were accused of acting as a front for German business interests. Henry Morgenthau, who was on the opposing side of the negotiations, would finally be quoted saying, The Wallenberg brothers were saved more by the emergence of the Cold War, rather than by any improvements of their business ethics. In these modern times, it's not about having the fastest homing pigeons anymore. We are now living in a digital age. This Swedish family of finance and banking, the Wallenberg family, owns or controls many of the global tech companies through their investment company called Investor AB and through their ownership of the Nasdaq Stock Exchange. But the crown jewel, which is the base for controlling information, is a company called Ericsson, which provides the telecommunications infrastructure in 184 countries across the world. These days, telecommunication and internet infrastructure is basically the same thing. Fiber optics. Ericsson holds over 65,000 telecommunications patents and has, to put it mildly, a global presence. In 1930, when Swedish business tycoon Ivar Kruger successfully muscled himself and his allies into controlling Ericsson, the Wallenberg sphere viewed this development with concern and skepticism. To quote the official statement, probably the understatement of the year, the Wallenberg family successfully regained control of Ericsson in 1932, directly following the sudden death of Ivar Kruger. In the beginning of March 1932, Ivar Kruger was attending the funeral of French Prime Minister Aristide Briand, who had died on the 7th of March, under strange circumstances. Aristide Briand was allied with Kruger, and also a strong opponent of fascism and economic dictatorship. Kruger and his American and French bank allies were determined to continue lending money to Germany. In this way, Hitler, and of course the Second World War, could certainly have been prevented. This was obviously not in Wallenberg's interests, as they had large shareholdings, both in the military-industrial complex and also in a company called IG Farben, which was a huge German chemicals conglomerate with subsidiaries both in Sweden and the US, and was the driving industrial force behind Hitler's war machinery. The interests behind IG Farben were closely allied with Hitler and the Nazis, and one can seriously question who was planning what, and for what strategic purposes, on a much longer timeline. IG Farben, among other things, ran concentration camps and manufactured the Zyklon B gas, which history quite loudly tells us was used in the Nazi gas chambers. The Wallenbergs and the Swedish establishment's connections to Hitler and the Nazis goes even deeper than that, but we cannot cover it all in this episode. So... The funeral of Aristide Briand had taken place on the 12th of March 1932 and the official story is that Ivar Kruger, after the funeral, went up to his room and shot himself in the chest. Considering the circumstances around Briand, Kruger and Germany and what directly followed his death, there is absolutely no question in our minds that this was a murder and nothing short of a pre-planned and well-executed coup. On the day following the murder of Kruger, several individuals appeared and claimed that they represented a royal commission from Sweden. There was nothing royal about it, but it somehow convinced the French authorities. Among these men were Wallenberg's lawyer Hugo Stenbeck, the governor of Stockholm Torsten Nothing, Olaf Ashberg, called the Red Banker, and Jacob Wallenberg himself. 
They then completely illegally, without any correct balance sheets, seized all Ivar Kruger's assets, which they then valuated, and declared that all his companies in both Sweden and internationally were bankrupt. They even claimed that Kruger was a swindler and that his assets were worthless. The shareholders in Kruger's companies lost all their assets, both in Sweden and abroad. Ivar Kruger's brother and several of Kruger's employees were even jailed for crimes they never committed. Kruger's assets were realized on the world market, and the same people who investigated Kruger could buy the now useless stocks at bargain prices. The Kruger Group is estimated to have included more than 200 different companies in 1929 to 1930, including Kruger and Toll AB, holding company for the entire Kruger Group, STAB, Swedish Matchstick AB, International Match Corporation, IMCO, USA, a holding company for match production in countries outside Europe, Stora Kopperbergs Bergslags AB, large forestation company, SKFAB, Swedish Ball Bearing Factories, LKAB, Large Mining Company, Bolidens Groove AB, Gold Deposits, Fastigets AB Hovudstaden, Large Real Estate Company, Telephone AB, LM Ericsson, the world's largest telecom company, and many other large international companies, even John Foster Dulles, the brother of Alan Dulles, took part in the dismantling of the Kruger Empire. John Foster Dulles was a senior partner of the law firm of Sullivan and Cromwell, same as his brother, and was the representative for Wallenberg Stockholm's Enskilda Bank in the United States. After that, Kruger's entire business empire came under the control of the Wallenberg sphere, and Ericsson became Marcus Wallenberg's baby, in lack of a better word. By taking control of Ericsson, the Wallenbergs was well on their way to establishing a monopoly on telecommunications. To make matters worse, the Wallenbergs are also closely connected to a company called Cryptograph, which developed cryptography machines used for intelligence communications all throughout modern history, starting with France just in time for the Second World War. Boris Hagelin, who was the owner of Cryptograph, at least on paper, had worked for the Wallenbergs right up until he was put in charge of cryptograph. The cryptography machines were even manufactured by Ericsson just to make things even more apparent. The company later changed its name to Crypto AG and moved to Switzerland. The sinister aspect of this was that these cryptographic machines had back doors built into them right from the start and this was later revealed in something called the biggest intelligence coup of the century. In 2014, the NSA revealed that the owner, Boris Hagelin, had a gentleman's agreement with them as early as 1951. In 2020, it was revealed that from 1960, Crypto AG had a licensing agreement with the CIA, and in the 1970s, it was sold to the CIA and the German BND. There is a lot of history that shines even more light on the Wallenberg family's involvement with the intelligence community. Apart from the obviously close relationship with Alan Dulles, we can just put it like this. Are there any intelligence services that can survive without access to the telecommunications infrastructure? And what sort of influence can you wield if you control the production of cryptographic signaling equipment used for military and diplomatic communication? Again, who has the real power? Let's just say that there's no coincidence that Ericsson had to make a deal with the American Department of Justice in December 2019 because of widespread corruption. Sometime later, the story broke that Ericsson has even bribed ISIS. What did Donald Trump have to say about Ericsson in 2016? In 2009, a company called Ericsson came under U.S. pressure for selling telecom equipment to several oppressive governments, including Sudan, Syria, and Iran. 
Some of these regimes use those technologies to monitor and control their own people. In June 2011, Hillary Clinton's State Department began adding goods and services to a list that might be covered under expanded sanctions on Iran and other state sponsors of terrorism. During that time, Erickson sponsored a speech by Bill Clinton, paying him $750,000, his highest paying speech. In April 2012, the Obama administration issued an executive order imposing sanctions on telecom sales to Iran and Syria, but those sanctions did not cover Erickson's work in Iran. In our next episode, we will shine an even bigger light on the small but not quite so insignificant country called Sweden. Thank you for listening. <laughs>